Right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first part of our series on the 70 weeks of Daniel. This will be a four-part series. Very important one, and we'll discuss very important things. Tonight is an introduction with some important notes for the next several weeks as we discuss this important aspect of Bible prophecy. So um, very important, even for those who might be, be listening, if you would like my speaking notes, please try and get a hold of me. Please email me or email us, and I can get those, those notes uh, to you. Also, just before we pray, um, this is a very good book for, for you to get. If you can, it's free. You can find it on PDF if you want to then print it at home. Or you, can, you can purchase the book. It's called Unfulfilled Prophecy by Sir Robert Anderson. It's a very good book to have. It's a bit technical, but it's just nice to have in what we're going to deal with. So I just sort of let you know about, about this book that you can, can look through and keep uh, for yourself. Um, so we're going to open in prayer tonight. So uh, let's bow our heads together and let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time together as we consider your word. We thank and praise you for, for what we are going to discuss. This is very important relating to our understanding of, of Bible prophecy. And help us, Lord, to, to really focus our hearts and minds on your word. Help us to be discerning. Help us, Lord, to be willing and be open to what you have to say to us in your word. And we thank and praise you, Lord, for the fact that your word is true and we can trust you and trust your word. And we just pray for this evening where everything's said and done, bring you honor and glory. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So we are going to look at four parts to uh, Daniel 70 weeks. This is a very exhaustive study, possibly, but we're going to try and condense it. We're going to work through it in four parts and we're going to try and really get to know Daniel's 70 weeks. So that's important because I believe it's the cornerstone of Bible prophecy. Now, um, the difficulty is that you have two types of people generally in the church. You have those who are not interested in Bible prophecy, that's concerned about it, that get scared about it, that don't want to live in a place where they talk about anything that could be controversial or difficult. And then you get the other folks who crave Bible prophecy. It's all they do. Mm. They're not interested in anything else. And those are the two extremes in the church. And I believe both parties, whether you avoid it or whether you crave it, both of those parties don't have a real grip and understanding of Daniel 70 weeks. Because when you do, you'll be able to see the whole picture and you don't have to either be avoidant of it or too anxious for Jesus to come back so that the world could burn. And that's sometimes how people are. And we need to try and really understand Bible prophecy from the biblical perspective and have a balance on these things. And that's why the 70 weeks of Daniel is so important. Now, I must highlight, and I will highlight in the general introduction as well, there are different views on this. And we have to be respectful of that because I read an article in the week, a uh, different perspective on it, someone that completely disagrees with what I'll say over the next for parts, um, but what they said, I don't agree with, but they had a method in, in how they followed it. But we have to come to a conclusion on this issue. Please don't feel that it's a good thing to be Switzerland on this. Mm. You have to come to a place. Either you take one view and that's how you're gonna build your concept or idea or framework for Bible prophecy or the other, but you have to be able to make a decision. It can't be a case of just saying, well, I'm going to not know. We have to know this because everything hinges on these passages in Daniel chapter 9. So we're going to take our reading tonight. Tonight's just an introduction, but there are a few things we're going to share. I will repeat several things throughout tonight and also in these four parts. This is very, very important. Um, people have written books about this. It's taken them years to compile the understanding of this. And I'm going to try and do it in four hours it's not going to really work but we're going to see what we can do so let's look at daniel chapter 9 we're going to read verse 20 to 27 so daniel chapter 9 and we're just going to read uh verse 20 to 27 okay so i'm just going to read from verse 20 
Now, while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I've now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Just from a Christian perspective, um, can you imagine if Gabriel says to you, from heaven, you are greatly beloved? I mean, I don't think it can be. It would just be, wow, amazing. And that is the Christian. Ephesians 1, verse 6, we're accepted in the beloved. So you are beloved. Mm. And verse 24 says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in, in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. Until, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So it's important for us to remember that Daniel is the revelation of the Old Testament. So if you read Revelation in the New Testament, if you go to the Old Testament, Daniel is the revelation of the Old Testament. Therefore, why I say this, when you read Daniel, the imagery spoken of in Daniel that everyone gets really panicked about is repeated in Revelation. So if you know Daniel, you understand the imagery of Revelation. It's very simple, really. It's not that difficult. And the important thing is that Daniel tells you what the imagery is. So Daniel doesn't the book of Daniel doesn't share this imagery with you and leave it up in the air. In the very chapter, whether it's Daniel chapter 2 or Daniel chapter 7, the chapter itself tells you what the interpretation is. Not up to you, you know, thin air and sort of the minister has to figure this out. It tells you in the text. So when Revelation 13 comes along and you have the beast coming out of the sea and everyone gets panicked, I'm like, why are you panicked when Daniel tells you what it is? It shouldn't be difficult. And that's important. So Daniel is the cornerstone of prophecy in the Old Testament. Why? Because Daniel specifically focuses on the second advent. This is very important from a Jewish perspective and even important from a Christian perspective with those who might disagree with what I say over these four parts. The reason why is because many people read Old Testament prophecy only relating to the first advent of Christ. And you'd say, well, that's not what it is. Well, the Jews read the same way. So the Jews will read the Old Testament in relation to the Messiah's coming because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So everything that is to come for them and what uh, the Old Testament speaks of is the, the advent of the Messiah because the Messiah hasn't come yet. And so many reformed and allegorical approached people will read it the same way where they'll say that everything was fulfilled in the first advent. So where the Jew does not accept Jesus and still sees the, ad, the first advent as being futuristic, those that take an allegorical approach will say, well, all of these things that you are speaking about was actually fulfilled in Jesus and just after. And therefore, when you take a premillennial approach and you believe in the future return of Christ to establish his kingdom, you will understand, and what's very important, is the multiple fulfillment of prophecy. That in Jesus Christ's first advent, certain prophecies were fulfilled, but those are not the ultimate fulfillment of these prophecies. There will still be a futuristic fulfillment of it, which we will discuss.
throughout this introduction, which is very important. So the introduction is important for us to understand everything that is to come. So understanding the 70 weeks of Daniel gives us a framework and a clear understanding of eschatology or the end times. And that's what, what I would want from a mature Christian or those who, who read the scriptures. And we don't run around and we talk about all these things where, you know, I believe in this and that person believes in this and everyone runs around with all these views and thoughts and stuff and it's all over the place. And what happens is no one actually sits down and says, okay, but what does Daniel 70 weeks say? I don't hear that. So my whole framework of, of believing in the rapture and in the tribulation, the second coming in the kingdom, all relates to Daniel 70 weeks, not because I just like the rapture. And many people just like the rapture concept because it's 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 it's, it's sort of um, it was hipster 120 years ago. Now it's not cool anymore, but it was cool 120 years ago mm -hmm. to be a rapture person. And then everyone just likes the concept of the rapture, but I'm not going to explain why. Why do you say the rapture is pre-tribulation? People don't know why. They just think it's they just don't like the concept. Well, if you look at Daniel 70 weeks, it gives you the framework. And therefore, if someone disagrees with what I share and not what I share, what, what premillennial Bible teachers will share, they will share, they have to disagree on the basis of Daniel 70 weeks because they have to have an apologetic for their view on Daniel 70 weeks because otherwise you're talking of different things because revelation fits into Daniel 70 weeks. Either it has been fulfilled or it will be fulfilled in the future. And therefore, to truly have a constructive theological and biblical discussion about the end times, we need to know Daniel 70 weeks. Otherwise, we become those who speak and don't know what they're talking about. Or you could be those who want to avoid discussing this because we don't want to get involved in it. And unfortunately, you have to get involved. That is what we need to do. Now, there are two interpretations when it comes to prophecy. The first is a literal interpretation. Taking into account certain figurative language, yes, but primarily it's literal. And the second one is what is called the figurative or allegorical approach to scripture, whereby things are spoken of mostly in symbols. It represents something else, and it is taken a lot of the things figuratively. There's also another sort of approach where things historically have been fulfilled and doesn't have a future fulfillment per se. Now, although I disagree with the figurative allegorical approach, as I said right at the beginning, I read a paper that's completely different to my view on Daniel 70 weeks. And the person who was well-researched that had certain ideas. It's not the fact that we were dealing with someone that doesn't know their theology. I disagree with them, but we mustn't just have a um, sort of dismiss, dismissive attitude toward those who might disagree because it has to be a theological discussion. And the problem normally within the church is that the ministers can talk certain theologies. Although I have met a minister who didn't know what the difference is between premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial. He asked me to explain it to him. And he was a minister for 20 years, which is a scary thought in mm. itself, but it happens. But normally what happens is the ministers can talk theology. The people in the pew just get what the, what the minister is saying. And therefore, the people in the pew start talking to each other, not knowing what they're talking about. And then it becomes destructive. And that's what we want to avoid because I don't want to, we don't in the body of Christ want to fight. We want to disagree. That's okay. But disagree based on an objective source. Instead of becoming emotional, overly worked up, and it just becomes destructive, which is not what we want. So we want to avoid conflict unnecessarily, but you also don't want to say that we all are not going to talk about it because if the word of God is important to us, we need to talk about it. Not so. And therefore, we have to be able to talk. We need to talk on a biblical framework. So as we study this passage, we can deal with in Daniel, Daniel 9. But as we study this passage, we have to realize it is complex. It will be complex. And there will be things that I will maybe say I don't know. And that's okay. But we need to be clear on what it's saying within the light of the whole counsel of God. So what's going to happen is we're going to read Daniel 9, but not take it in isolation. Because we have to then know, okay, certain things have transpired already. And certain things we can see has happened. Therefore, we read it back from. So what I'm saying is we're reading it back from Revelation back because we already have Revelation. Although Revelation hasn't occurred, we already have the text. Therefore, you can look back at Daniel 9 and put it into its proper context. Because when Daniel said that, and even when, 
when the Old Testament saints were reading it, or even the times of the Gospels, they never had revelation. So they could only read it with a limited understanding. You and I read it based upon the full counsel that has been revealed, and therefore we can put it into place. So it will be actually quite limiting to say, I'm just sticking to the text. It doesn't help you stick to the text if you don't stick to the full counsel. And that would be a dangerous thing. So I have to bring in, okay, well, this has occurred, and this has occurred, and we can see it taking place in Revelation. So it's not a case of, oh, this is a mystery. I don't know what this is saying, because you have Revelation that tells you exactly what it's saying when you read that. Okay. So Daniel 17, which will help us to see the distinction in God's plan, because this is the key thing. And I want you to go to this reading. That's why I'm saying it's an introduction tonight, but there are things I need to share with you to understand why this is important. So turn with me to Romans 11. Because to understand Daniel's 70 weeks will bring to light the importance of understanding the difference between Israel and the church. And we have to understand the difference between Israel and the church prophetically. Because if we don't, it leads to confusion. So if you turn with me to Romans 11, which is a very, very important chapter, and especially in light of what is being said in Daniel 70 weeks. But when you read what Gabriel said to Daniel, he spoke about this for your people and for Israel. So, the, so, so what happens is if you take a sort of figurative allegorical approach and you are saying that the church is Israel, Israel is the church, what does that mean then? If Gabriel is saying that these prophecies relate to the establishment of Israel again and the city and the Messiah to be in his position as the Messiah, and you are saying that that's not talking about Israel, then we're in real trouble. And that's why Romans 11 is very, very important. So we look at some verses here. Firstly, verse 1 and 2. And this is Paul writing, of course. And he's writing after Christ. And I need to share that because I don't know how people sidestep this chapter, to be honest with you. I say then, as God has God cast away his people after Christ? Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Do you see that he's not talking about sort of, I am also of the people of God. He's saying Israelite specifically, which means you can't sidestep. I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that what the scripture says of Elijah and how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, and then it goes on to poor Elijah and his depression and how he was frustrated. And the Lord says, I've reserved unto myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. So let's also look at verse 15. Verse 15. Yeah, verse 15. Also, is the apostle to the Gentiles, yeah, makes sense, yeah, 100%. So, it says here for, and you can read from verse 11, actually, the whole chapter you can read, but I'm just gonna highlight certain verses. For if they're caught, for if they're being cast away, that's Israel, is the reconciling of the world. So, Israel being set aside brings reconciliation to the world, which is quite interesting in relation to 2 Corinthians 5, preaching the message of reconciliation. For if they're being cast away as the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Now see the context there, the reconciliation for the world, what will their acceptance be? So it's, it's drawing the dichotomy between the world in a general sense and Israel. So you can't say that Israel just is no. part of people. He's drawing a clear dichotomy between the world, which includes Israel in a general sense, but then highlighting Israel's acceptance. And that's why Daniel's 70 weeks is important, because he's saying the, the sort of acceptance and the reconciliation of God's people and the city and the Messiah. The longing there is for the restoration of Israel. That's what Daniel was longing for. So if you believe that's already occurred, I find that very interesting, because it hasn't. When has Israel been restored? Ever. Even when they went back, ask, ask Ezra and Nehemiah how that went. Ask Jesus how it looked when he came to earth in his first advent. It didn't look great, did it? They wept when they saw the temple. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not good. So, also we're going to look at verse 25 to 29, which is once again a key passage. It says here in verse 25, For 
I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so will Israel will be saved, as it is written, the liver will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, there are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And that's very important. So there's important factors here, and, and, and Romans 11 is important. So when we look at it biblically, what we stand on has to be a biblical thing. So why do I believe in Israel's future? Not just because I like it, not just because I think it's a nice little thing to do. It is because the scriptures in Romans 11 clearly teaches Israel's future salvation. Then you link that in with Daniel's 70 weeks that teaches clearly that there's going to come a time when a covenant will be made with Israel, and that will lead us to the end, which will ultimately be their salvation. So you put those things together, and it's like, these are the things I stand upon. So someone could disagree with it, that's fine. But it's not just because I like it. It's because it's biblical. And the fact that Paul writes about this when he does should highlight this to us. He's not just saying it's a throwaway statement. He literally is telling you clearly of Israel's hope and Israel's future. So what are the important factors in this prophecy of Daniel? Firstly, the entire prophecy, and you read that in the text, is dealing with Daniel's people and Daniel's city. That's literal. So Daniel's people aren't spiritual. Because when you look at the history of Israel, which we'll deal with in a little bit, it was always the full nation. It was never just a remnant. When they went into captivity, it was the nation. When they went into captivity up in the north or the south, it was the nation. Yes, God speaks to a remnant as well, and there's a spiritual side to those who are truly saved. But mostly the judgment is clearly for the whole nation. And therefore, the restoration in the context here was the understanding of Israel, not just a little portion. There's a bigger picture at play. And then also, there are two princes mentioned when you read the text in, in Daniel, of course. There are two princes. The one... Of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And the other one has to be another prince. And the other prince is not a system. It's a person. Jesus Christ is not a system, is he? No, he's a person. And therefore, the other prince is a person who is the Antichrist as a person. Then also, thirdly, the prophecy covers a very specific period. And that's what we're going to deal with in the next three sessions specifically. That it covers a very specific period. Now, the return of Jesus Christ has no time frame. We don't know when he's going to return. Whether the rapture per se, or even with the second coming, you can't pinpoint the exact day. But there is a framework specifically leading up to the second coming, which the book of Revelation gives you. Daniel's 70 weeks gives us a framework. And therefore, I say you can disagree with it. It's 100% fine. And it's not plotting dates. It's not about plotting dates when Jesus is going to come back. It's telling you how the Bible says it will unfold. Not plotting dates. That's important. So, a bit of background. I need to share this background with you in relation to Daniel. Because what's so key to understand, and I, I don't always fully understand this, but it's so important, so interesting. But when you read the book of Daniel, it is connected to, to Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So, so Jeremiah was prophesying at a similar time as Daniel. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel was a bit later, but also dealing with the captivity. And therefore, there's a link with these. And it's quite interesting with the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36 and 37, because Ezekiel writes in chapter 37 of the Valley of the Dry Bones of the Lift. Mm -hmm. So all of them are dealing. Jeremiah specifically more deals with the Babylonian captivity to come. So Daniel, oh, Jeremiah, sorry, looks a bit forward to this judgment that's coming. Ezekiel is far more about teaching within the captivity and then the restoration to come. So when you read Jeremiah, it's always woe, 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 because that the woe is coming. And that's important. So there are two main captivities. Two main captivities. First is, so just put it back on, sorry, I just preempted that. Israel as a nation... Most of us know it was split in two after Solomon. 
So split in two. But there are two main captivities the Bible will reference. The first is with the northern kingdom, which were the ten tribes, were taken up north into Assyria. That's the first major captivity, the Assyrian captivity. Other three tribes, because there are actually 13 tribes technically, the other three tribes were left in Jerusalem, the south, and that is uh, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. And what's important is that when you use the term Jew, it refers far more to Judah, because Judah was responsible for keeping the worship because Levites were there. So that's why Benjamin's also a very prominent tribe. It's quite interesting that Paul the Apostle uses the fact that he's a Benjamite. So Judah, Benjamin, and Levi were seen as the ones who kept the religion going, the purity of it. The ten tribes who went into Assyria were always seen as a bit cast away. There's actually quite an interesting connection between the northern tribes and the Samaritans as well. The Samaritans are pretty much the children of the northern tribes who have come down. So the two main captivities, the first is the northern kingdom in Assyria. The second is the southern kingdom in Babylon. Everything focuses on the Babylonian captivity. And that's important. So I'm going to give you a bit of background, just a little bit of history for those who don't know. It's very interesting. So in 604 BC, Nebuchadnezzar entered Jerusalem and took some captives. This is what's important. So Nebuchadnezzar came, and what they used to do is annex a place. Basically say, I keep the king in place. It's mine. You bow down to me. Great stuff. I keep you in place. And I'm going to go back to Babylon, and you can do your thing, but you must just be under my hand, so to speak. And in that, Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and took the best of the crop and took them back to Babylon. So the best of the young men, the best looking, it's quite funny, it says, like, good looking, good teeth, <laughs> and basically took them to Babylon. And Daniel was part of that first batch of the captivity, which is important. But as history tells us, and as the Bible tells us, Joachim was the king, and he was like a puppet king. But to cut a long story short, basically there were three sort of key dates. The first one is 604, when Demetrius came. The second one is 598, when there was another rebellion, and Joachim was part of that sort of rebellion. Joachim, sorry, Joachim is his son, but Joachim was part of the, the that rebellion that was quashed and squashed by, by Nebuchadnezzar. And then a few, and another batch went. So it's possible and most probable that in 598, that is when Jeremiah and them were taken as well. And then, oh, sorry, Ezekiel. Thank you very much. The people at my notes, they correct me. And mm -hmm. um, the key here is 587 is the key one. So you've got these rebellions. 604, he comes, all fine. He just destroys the sort of rebellion in 598. But the key one here is 587. Because in 587, there was another rebellion. This was the final rebellion. When Nebuchadnezzar entered into Jerusalem and laid waste to it. Destroyed the city and destroyed the temple. And that's important. And that was a key one. And so what will happen is in the Old Testament, there will always be a reference back to that destruction of that temple. So in the notes, I have sort of Jer Jeremiah's ministry and also Ezekiel's ministry, which is very, very important. Um, also for you, important for you to know that this captivity lasted for 70 years in Babylon. That's important to note. Okay. So let's look at Daniel 70 weeks. This is an introduction. Now, I believe there are no prophecies clearer than Daniel 70 weeks. The reason why is because there's specific timing to this. So if, you, if you're going to look at it, you're going to say, well, you know, it's only sort of spiritual. We don't actually have the timing. That's the awkward thing because the Bible tells you specifically the timing of Daniel 70 weeks. It gives you specifics. And therefore, some people say, well, you're reading in. That's a view you can have. But when I read it, there, it gives you specific times. As I said, there are different views. And so I'm saying I, I read um, one specific one that was very well researched. And there were some points where they would differ. And they will take an allegorical approach and say that this all was fulfilled in the first advent of Christ. However, it was studiously done. It wasn't just person making, making things up as they go. They have reasons to say what they say. When I look at the text, there are very specific markers to why I disagree with him. But there are two 
prophecies I need to share with you that, that's important in, in, the, in regards to the book of Daniel. The first is Daniel chapter 2. So if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 2, and this is important to understand the framework here, because now Daniel, of course, is in Babylon, because we're leading up to the 17 weeks. Daniel is in Babylon. He's been taken captive. He's the best of the best. And now he's going to really um, show his wisdom. And of course, the king at the time was Nebuchadnezzar, a very famous king. And he has a dream. And the dream, of course, is of this statue or image with a head of gold, shoulders of silver, the abdomen of bronze, legs of iron and toes of iron and clay. And then Daniel interprets this dream. Now, what's key here is not as much the gold, the silver, because when Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and when Daniel interprets this dream, Nebuchadnezzar is not concerned about the head of gold. He's not concerned about the shoulders of silver. He's not concerned about the abdomen of bronze, the legs of iron or the toes. He's only concerned with the little stone. And the reason why the little stone comes and destroys the image. And strikes the image at the feet. And when the small stone strikes the image at the feet, the whole image comes tumbling down. That small stone grows and grows and grows and fills the whole world. And he's only interested with the small stone because he's, he finds this just mind-blowing. How this small stone basically destroys these things, this image. And that's important because that's dealing with the kingdom of God. Now, this is where we get, once again, come to disagreements amongst us theologically we need to be men and women of god and that's why i can deal with this in a respectful way because if we believe the kingdom of god was ushered in at the cross you can understand why people will then make the prophecy link in with the cross because some christians believe that the kingdom of god was ushered in when jesus died on the cross and rose again that was the start of the spiritual kingdom of god and therefore they'll look at the vision of the image and see the stone striking, and they will say, well, it's the Roman Empire, which is the feet. And look, Christ came during the Roman Empire, he conquered on the cross, and therefore that is when the kingdom then started, in a spiritual sense. If you are pre-millennial that I am, you will then understand that the legs of silver is the Roman Empire, and that the toes are an extension of the future whether you call it the revived Roman Empire, whatever you want to call it, it just is an extension in the future. And that's when the stone will strike the image. And so that's a very important part because what is Daniel asking in Daniel chapter 9? This is important. Daniel is praying. And what is he praying for? Lord, when will you restore us? Quite interesting, as I've said so often, I've stood in this hall. But Acts chapter 1, verse 6, what did Peter ask for the 12? When will you restore? Because they're just concerned. That's their concern. So Daniel is praying as well and saying, you know, Lord, I'm making supplication for the people and our sin because we want to go home. We want to go home. Then we look at Daniel chapter 7. And that's important. So Daniel chapter 2 gives you this image. The gold, let me just give you a rundown quickly. The head of gold is Babylon. The shoulders of silver is Persia and Medes. Then the abdomen is uh, the Greek Empire. And the legs are, of course, Rome. You've got two legs, Constantinople and Rome. And then you have the toes of iron and clay. And you can work through that interpretation. Whatever you see it as, it's just an extension of Rome. Because you'll have a lot of people with a lot of views on the toes. And it just gets awkward. Um, it's too much for my brain to worry about at this stage. Because people pinpoint stuff, and then it's the 12 stars of Europe, and you take two away, and you multiply it by 20, and divide by two, and this nonsense. Um, basically, the toes are going to be an extension, and you're, you're living in the extension now. Why? Because everything we know in society, in, in Europe, and everything we know in democracy and the way we function is an extension of the Roman Empire. It has extended. It is what it is. It doesn't have to encompass areas to be the extension of the Roman Empire. Why? Because democracy and the way that we function, what is what laws are we built on? What law? Roman law. So a lot of what our society is, is an extension. Rome didn't die in, 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 in the fifth century. It's still extended. And there's more to come with that. But I'm just saying that, that you can't pinpoint now 
trying to go into the map and find, you know, we must find the 10 toes and stuff. I don't think that's constructive. We have to leave it to see how it's going to play out. Okay. Because otherwise you start becoming like, ooh, inky, pinky, bonky, daddy bought a donkey. And that's not how you do Bible stuff. Because once you start doing that, then you're in real trouble. Okay. Be very, very careful. Because before you know it, next week, you could not have an EU anymore. Because I've heard my whole life, EU is this beast system. And before you know it, they destroy the EU and they build another one. And then we start. So you've got to be very careful in making grandiose statements on physical things that we actually don't know. The principle is, yes, globalism, 100%. But it doesn't mean it's the EU. Because they could destroy it very quickly and build another system. Okay. So when we look at Daniel 7, what you have is you have beasts now. So you have this lion, you have a bear, you've got a leopard, and then this terrible iron monster. And for much of my life, I believe that Daniel 7 mimics Daniel 2. The Daniel 2 is Nebuchadnezzar's vision, which is the gold, silver, the abdomen of bronze, and the legs of iron, etc. And that these beasts mimic that, and it's just the way in which it's seen differently. I now disagree with that a little bit. I believe Daniel 7 is referring to a future kingdom. Not the existing ones. Because many people say the lion refers to Babylon. The bear refers to Persia because of the raised paw and the, and the ribs and the mouth. And the leopard refers to the abdomen of bronze because Alexander's kingdom was so swift. I think that Daniel 7, Daniel is seeing the Antichrist system of Revelation 13. Because that system will encompass all of it. I think Revelation 13 gives you the picture. When the beast comes out, it looks like the lion, the bear, etc. So I don't think it specifically mimics that. In some ways it is, but I think Daniel's actually seen more toward what the future is going to look at. And that you can find, of course, in Revelation 13. But this is the key. We're not here to talk about all these prophecy things, but ultimately all of these things relate to one thing. What is the only concern? that the Christian should have in understanding the end times is when will the Lord do his work in Israel so that there will be a remnant to be saved to enter into the kingdom. That's how prophecy ends. Prophecy doesn't end with the rapture. Prophecy doesn't end with the tribulation. Prophecy ends when God has a remnant who will enter into the kingdom and be a nation of priests. That's ultimately what it is. And that's the key to Daniel's prophecies. It's the key to Zechariah. It's all about Jerusalem. It's all about Israel. And it's all about how God is going to work to bring about the salvation of a remnant to enter in. Because not all Jews will be saved. I believe in the tribulation. Jew will attack Jew more than ever. People will phone each other and say, well, Antichrist will come and where are these Jews? And someone will tell them, my next door neighbor, that they are, they are believers in Christ. Jew will persecute Jew. God will shake the bag and sift them that when he returns, only a remnant will be the true nation. The others will either have died or have been actually joining the Antichrist. Because in the first part of the tribulation, it's very clear that Israel, Israel as a nation is friendly with the Antichrist. So it's very similar to what we saw in the Second World War where people make phone calls and basically COVID as well when you had a party that phone. You were encouraged to find the government when your friends were having a party. They've got six people. They're only allowed five. And what you'll have is you'll have Jew being part of the Antichrist system to want to destroy the other Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And therefore, God will shake the bag. Okay. So please read Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. That gives you an insight into a lot of things happening in the future, but leads us to Daniel chapter 9. Because Daniel sees these things. But then he asks the question, okay, what does this mean now? Makes sense, because it's one thing to make the statements of what these things are, but what does it mean? And Daniel 9 gives you the meaning and the framework for how these things will play out. Okay, another important point for us is this. As we're going to look at timing, because we are going to look at timing, once again, we're not saying when the Lord is going to return, date and time, because that's not what we're doing. So if anyone reads that into this talk, then really it would be difficult because they're not listening. It's not about dates and times and stuff. It is about the framework that Daniel 9 gives us. But what's important to note is a Jewish year or a prophetic year is different 
from our years. We're not working on the Gregorian or Julian calendar here. Biblically, for Israel, working on a lunar solar calendar and a prophetic year is 360 days. So if you are dealing with anything prophetically, it goes on 360 days, not 364 slash 365. That's very, very important. Also, when we look at Daniel chapter 9, you go there with me. I need to share this with you because it's an important for the introduction side. So when it says here, Daniel 70 weeks, the word week is a Hebrew word, Shabua, which just means a period of seven. So the word weeks in Hebrew is Shabuah, which just means a period of seven. So why does it why do they use the term week? What is the most common way in which we use seven? It's for a week. How many days in a week? Seven. That's the framework we know. So the translators use the word weeks, but it's not specifically how the prophets understood that because even in Israel on several occasions the Bible will speak of weeks as in years and not days it just means a cycle of sevens okay so what's important is when you read Daniel 70 weeks the context itself shows you it can't be days why because if you go on days you have 490 days the, the, the rest restoration of the temple and the city of Ju Jerusalem itself lasted longer than that. So if, if, if it's only days, the whole prophecy falls apart because you still have the rebuilding of Jerusalem taking place. So you, you wouldn't even get close to that time-wise. And therefore, it can't be days. So what it is referring to is 490 years. That's what it's referring to. So these are weeks of, or sevens of, of years, not sevens of days. Also, what is quite interesting is that when you look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 especially, but throughout Revelation, it speaks of 1,260 days. Use that several times. If you work that out, it's three and a half years in prophetic years. So 1,260 days is exactly three and a half years of 360s. So what you see is the Bible does use that term. Now, generally, people that have an allegorical approach, when they approach the scriptures, will say, we don't know what that means. Yeah, it's fine. You can say, don't know what that means. But if you take it, prophetic years, and you take 1,260, it gives you exactly three and a half years. And what does that mean? What is three and a half years plus three and a half years? It gives you seven. And therefore, you start asking, question okay if daniel 70 weeks the last week is called the one final week which is seven years and i have 1260 repeated twice or three times i think it's logical to ask the question if i put three and a half together the three and a half i get seven what could possibly separate three and a half from three and a half what could possibly separate in the middle of the seven weeks well very clearly, something happens. And what could that be? Of course, the text will tell you it's when the Antichrist goes into the temple. Because the Lord says, when you see the abomination of desolation, then run for the hills. Because then it's really going to um, start where you have to basically pray for protection, so to speak. So let us look at the structure of the weeks. It's very important. We're going to deal with this throughout the next three parts. Basically, what you have is the first part to Daniel's 70 weeks is 7 times 7, which gives you 49 years. So the first part is 49, 7 times 7. That's the first part. And that is how long it took to rebuild Jerusalem, including the walls. Because what we're dealing with, and we'll explain that, of course, especially in the next session, we're not talking about the rebuilding of the temple. So don't fixate on Ezra. It's not Ezra. We're dealing with Nehemiah. Because it's the rebuilding, not just the temple, but of the streets and specifically of the walls. And Nehemiah is connected to the rebuilding of the walls. So you've got the first part, 7 times 7. Then you've got 62 times 7. So from the end of when that, those walls are built 
up to the death of the Messiah, when the Messiah is cut off, it's another 62 times 7. And then the most important part for us as well, which we know as, as, as Christians especially, and those now who have the book of Revelation, is that we are still waiting for the final 1 times 7 years, which is the great tribulation. So that's the structure. And that's basic, but we need to look at how you defend that. Because one thing to say, okay, well, this and this, but how do we actually look at it biblically and be able to defend it? So that's why it's going to be important to look at that throughout the next several talks. Also, another important thought, I just put it in here, that there are several desolations as well. So the Bible often speaks about the abomination of desolation, and there are several desolations. The first was Babylon, when they came in and desolated and destroyed Jerusalem. The second one is, is probably the most famous one. Other than Babylon is also pretty famous, but this one is the most uh, cringing. It's Antiochus Epiphanes, who went into the temple and slaughtered a pig. It's called the Great Abomination of Desolation. That gave rise to the Maccabean Revolt. It's quite interesting that that gave rise to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Funny. So that's the Syrian Abomination of Desolation. And then also you have... Another abomination of desolation, which is when Titus, the Roman general, besieged Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's quite interesting. It's quite terrific, actually. The history doesn't record it as much. But when Titus tried to destroy Jerusalem, it took him about four years. So the, the, the sort of um, siege started in about 66 AD and ended in 70 AD. They believe about a million Jews died. Because what, what, what Titus did was he cut off all supply from Jerusalem, people starved, and then you destroy them. So that's another abomination of desolation, which it could be 100%. And then, of course, the final one is the Antichrist, and that's the one specifically Paul writes about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when the Antichrist will sit and claim to be God, which is the final abomination of desolation that will give rise to the Great Tribulation, which will be great destruction of many things, and especially the persecution of Jewish believers at the time, and other believers as well. So it'll be a great persecution. So as we sort of conclude with some of these thoughts, we're going to look at Daniel's prayer. So just turn with me to Daniel 9 again. And I just want to highlight this prayer, which is very, very important. And what's important about this is, is how we speak as Christians. And I just highlight that we don't talk like this. There's something different about what it meant in the Bible to be a Jew to what we understand today as being a Christian, because we don't speak like this. I generally look at everyone here in our church and Christians, I see them as brothers and sisters. I don't care what country you're from, what your background is. But what happens is, um, when it comes to Israel, Paul writes about this, he longs for his kinsmen to be saved. There's a desire for the Jewish nation. There's something that connects. As we all feel connected to those of our country and culture, etc. But there's something special about that connection. That's what you see here from verse 20. I just want to read verse 20 to 23. Now, while I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sins of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. This is key. Why is it such a big thing? Why is, is Israel such a big thing? Why is Jerusalem such a big thing? And why, again, coming back to Acts chapter 1 verse 6, why did the disciples ask the question, when will the kingdom be restored? Because they know the prophecies publicly. They knew that when Israel is in its country and they are flourishing, it will be the flourishing of the world. And that's key. It's not just because he wants to go home. It's because Daniel understood the bigger picture and how the world will be reached. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. and informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out. What command is that? It's a heavenly command, isn't it? Command in heaven went out. The Lord said, 
this is what I've appointed. The command went out, and I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. And so that's the mindset that Daniel has. And therefore, when we read this and you read Daniel, you've got to understand the longing that he had and the longing that God even has is to restore Israel to her position. Because when Israel is restored to its position, it will be the great blessing to the world. The world cannot be blessed while Israel is not in a position of blessedness. It's not going to happen. And that's important. Okay. So, as we conclude, the key to the 70 weeks is the restoration of Israel. That's the key to it. That's why it's so important. And that's why we cannot have the end times or the conclusion or consummation until Israel is restored. Now, that's not talking about the nation currently and the whole 1948 debate. This is talking about a true remnant of salvation that will come and God will bring about that restoration. So this is only the introduction, and then we're going to deal with a few more things in the next several weeks. We'll deal with the first part. We'll deal with the first part of, of the, the 70 weeks, and then we're going to deal with second, and then, of course, deal with the tribulation. So, of course, for those who are here live, we'll deal with that every second Sunday. Okay, so I'm going to close and then um, leave it open for questions. Okay.